episode 26. God bless you. Welcome to Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. I'm Kirk Van Odeham, your host to the podcast that provides brief, thoughtful, biblical answers to your questions. And I'm so happy to have you tuning in uh, to Bible FAQ again today. Welcome to all of our new listeners and welcome back uh, to our previous listeners as well. And uh, before I uh, move on and say anything else, I want to welcome uh, any uh, listeners that may have found us through a new online resource called Discipleship Central. I am uh, extremely honored uh, to be a part of Discipleship Central, a content provider. And Discipleship Central can be found at the website, just as you'd expect, discipleshipcentral.com. So what this is, is an official resource of the United Pentecostal Church International that contains um, streaming media. And uh, they are uh, determined and committed to continue to produce new original content. Uh, But already there is uh, many original uh, videos that are available uh, in um, just some of a more devotional nature, some of more of a serious teaching series. Uh, and also, uh, there's video of um, UPCI conferences uh, for the past several years, including General Conference and North American Youth Conference. Uh, there's popular classic preaching uh, of both um, uh, well-known preachers today and those of years gone by. And, uh, and then also a, a sort of a repository of four popular podcasts. Uh, by UPCI podcasters. And so, again, I'm honored to be a part of that. I am uh, excited to have my podcast, Bible FAQ with Kirk Van, listed there. So I encourage you, check out discipleshipcentral.com, and you will be glad you did. Well, uh, I want to get go ahead and get right into uh, the content for today's episode. And today's going to be a little unique in that I in that I'm not going to take a new question and address it or a series of questions. Rather, uh, I've done this once before in the past. Uh, I'm going to kind of respond to some comments I received uh, from a recent podca- uh, recent episode of the podcast. In fact, it's the most recent episode, episode 25, uh, which was basically on the topic of the, of the so-called or alleged missing verses in modern translations of the Bible. And if you listen, if you haven't listened to that, I encourage you to check it out. You can go to my website, kirkvan.com, and get more information about all the methods and means that you can access the podcast in audio format or video format. Um, and so uh, uh, if, you have, if you're interested in textual criticism in the differences between, say, the King James Version and modern translations, uh, and these, this question of uh, so-called missing verses it would definitely be something you'd be interested in. But as just a quick summary, uh, the real question is whether the verses have been removed uh, by modern translations or have they possibly been added by previous manuscripts that are uh, not as old as some of the original manuscripts. So that's the big question, and that's what we kind of discuss in the episode. And so I do, to some degree, it wasn't the whole basis of the whole uh, discussion, but I do, to some degree, contrast the King James Bible, which is based on the textual basis of the received text, uh, versus some modern translations, NIV, ESV, and others, that are based on the critical text and and. Uh, and do have some, uh, uh, there are some verses that are not, and words and phrases that are not included in these because of the textual basis. I'm not going to take the time to re-explain all that. Just check out episode 25 if you're interested. But uh, probably more so than any episode that I've done so far, I received a lot of comments about this, mostly in social media, uh, but in other formats as well. And I just kind of want to touch on some of them because I think they're interesting and I think there's a, you know, a few things I can add to the discussion. So one, uh, one listener uh, made the content, uh, comment, rather, I'm a firm believer in King James only. I have researched it and prayed about it and can say in all sincerity that God has answered the question. So um, 
I guess my response to this is, uh, it's my, uh, you know, understanding that some people have an emotional or sentimental attachment to the King James Version. And I don't mean that in an insulting way or, 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 or anything of that nature. In fact, I would include myself in that camp. I have a sentimental attachment to the King James Version, not so much that I reject other modern translations of the Bible, but it's certainly a strong preference for me in many ways. Um, and I utilize it uh, all the time uh, today. I read other translations, study other translations as well. Uh, but but I can understand uh, some people's reluctance uh, to change and reluctance to accept uh, modern translations that do have differences and distinctions to what they're used to. Um, so I'm not by any means bashing the King James Version. Quite the contrary. I myself love it. All I was really trying to say with the previous episode is that modern translations should not be considered tainted or inaccurate. That is just a, a, a complete falsification and misunderstanding of, of, of the whole uh, topic, if you will. Um, I do believe that the textual basis for modern translation has better manuscript evidence. That's just, that's just clear from the scholarship. That's just clear from the, you know, 5,800 manuscripts that we have for the for the critical texts and the modern the basis for the modern translations versus the dozen or so uh, that existed for the King James version. Uh, all things considered, as I mentioned, these differences are minimal and fairly insignificant. Uh, but we shouldn't discount these modern translations, but rather we should see them as a tool for even better comprehension and understanding of God's word. Um, and that's really what I was trying to say in that in that. Uh, episode in episode 25. Uh, you know, regarding the comment of, of this listener, I would be curious to know what the research on this topic entailed that made this person conclude that only King James Version should be read, or it's the only real version or accurate version, or however one wants to portray it. Uh, my guess is the research probably consisted, and again, I'm not trying to be demeaning here, but my, my honest guess would be it consisted of, you know, reading some King James only uh, <laughs> propaganda, for lack of a better term, you know, blogs and booklets put out by some of this group where they misrepresent and mischaracterize the translation process, the translators themselves, all that sort of thing. Um, you know, I know that's out there. Um, all I can say is um, that type of information is inaccurate and misleading. Uh, the very strong consensus among scholars and clergy is that the critical text on which the NIV, ESV, and many other, most other modern translations is based is uh, most likely the closest we have to the original manuscripts uh, of, of, of the Bible, New Testament in particular. And that's not just the quote unquote liberal theologians, uh, but often and, and primarily very religiously or doctrinally conservative, uh, conservative ones as well. Uh, uh, you know, evangelicals and other uh, conservative uh, theologians and Bible uh, scholars and students who do believe in the infallibility of Scripture, who do believe in the inerrancy in Scripture, uh, but they have gone where the evidence leads in terms of, of the manuscripts uh, themselves, the textual basis for the translations that they do. Again, more information in episode 25. So, and also for, for uh, my fellow apostolics, I don't want to bring specific names into it because I don't want to mischaracterize anyone's view, uh, but it's very clear to me that, that uh, certain highly respected apostolic theologians uh, take a very positive view on several modern translations and encourage the use of them. Um, not exclusive use or to the neglect of the King James Version or any other particular translation, but see them as very positive developments in, in biblical uh, scholarship and research and, and uh, tools to understanding God's words that benefit us as followers of Jesus. So I'm, I'm certainly not alone uh, in, my, in my take and my view on that. And, and then also just kind of to wrap this up regarding the King James only phenomena. Uh, obviously, I'm not a fan of that of that particular movement, if you will. Um, 
as I said, I think it's mostly based on sentimentality and misinformation. Uh, and what I'm talking about, not people who like the King James Version. I'm one of those people. I'm talking about people who somehow believe it's the only uh, accurate translation or the only inspired translation or that others are somehow corrupt or, or, or manipulative or whatever. Um, based on, I think the King James only movement is based on a theological view that I think is mistaken. Many of the people might not know what the theological view is, uh, even if they have it, but, uh, there's, there's this view called verbal plenary preservation. The word plenary, all it really means is absolute or complete or unconditional, uh, that sort of thing. So then verbal plenary preservation is the view of the absolute complete preservation of all the words of scripture. And I, I want to emphasize the word preservation. Now there's a, there's a, there's a doctrinal view that's similar to that called verbal plenary inspiration. And what that is, is the absolute or complete inspiration of every word of scripture. Now I of course believe in the absolute inspiration of every word of scripture. But most people typically believe, conservative theologians, that the inspiration of Scripture pertains to the original autographs, uh, those, those um, handwritten documents that the original authors of the, of the Bible uh, wrote, the, the very original uh, uh, autographs, the very original documents. Uh, whereas uh, preservation refers to you know this this idea of the absolute preservation refers to the what what scholars call the apographs or the copies of the autographs and they would say not only was the was the documents that Moses and the prophets and you know the gospel writers and the apostle Paul and, and Peter and James and the others uh, all the writers of the New Testament not only were the documents that they wrote themselves uh, absolutely and perfectly inspired by God himself but the copies of those were perfectly preserved without any errors or without any issues or problems. Uh, and I just think this view of, of verbal plenary preservation, again, not inspiration, I believe in the inspiration of scripture, but this view of preservation uh, that the absolute perfection in the transmission or copying process is simply an untenable and indefensible position. And some even take it to the extent not only those copies and the copies of copies and the copies of copies of copies throughout the century are perfect, uh, but that also translation into other language itself was perfect. And, uh, and uh, but again, this is an untenable, indefensible uh, position. It ignores all the manuscript evidence that we have in the, in the, Literally, uh, you know, two hundred thousand some variants between uh, the 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 thousands of of manuscripts uh, that exist for the Old and New Testaments. Now, that's not to say the process is corrupt and tainted and terrible, but I mean, it, it is a huge exercise in, in denial to say that there was no error, copying errors made ever through the. 2,000 years of people hand copied word for word, sentence for sentence, page for page um, uh, of these manuscripts. I mean, you can just look at them. I mean, the, the scholars who look at them will tell you, yeah, there, there's little errors made here and there. Again, none of these errors, none of these variants, none of these discrepancies are significant in any spiritual or moral or theological doctrinal sense, uh, but it's, it's just it's just indefensible to try to say it was a perfect process, uh, that it was, um, now I do believe in a general sense, God preserved his word, the transmission of his word through the ages. And I think that the developments of the 20th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, uh, even add to the, to the preservation of God's word in a way that we never had before. Uh, so, but King James version uh, King James only adherents have to deny all the evidence, have to say there's no mistakes ever made. Well, that's just, that means just simply indefensible. I mean, there's, you can say that and you can have that 
you know, I guess that spiritual persuasion, uh, but the evidence just simply doesn't substantiate it. And then the King James Version only adherents also have to address many questions about the King James Version itself. If they believe that it's the perfect translation, the perfect English translation, or that it's free of error or the best or whatever. I mean, I'm sure there's a spectrum of beliefs, but they'd have to address the question, why did the received text itself developed by this theologian Erasmus, as we discussed in the, uh, why did the received text itself, the textual basis for the King James Version and many other English translations, why did it go undergo so many revisions even after the publication of the King James Version? Um, the reality of the situation is they realized that there was minor errors made that they could correct and they could improve upon the text and they could make it uh, more error-free and accurate. And why not do that if you have the ability to do that? Um, but this idea that it, it was perfect, um, you know, why, why, why did it need to undergo revision if it was perfect? And why was, for that matter, why was the King James Version even necessary? If the transmission and translation process is perfect, there were several English translations that pre-existed the King James Version, the Tyndale Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, uh, among others. Uh, so why was it necessary if, um, you know, these King James only uh uh, adherents want to criticize uh, scholars who want to improve upon, um, you know, the translation process and make better updated, uh, perhaps in some cases believed to be more accurate um, English translations of the Bible. And, and, and they're scoffed at by the King James only adherents, but that was the same mission of the King James translators themselves to some degree. Uh, and they're saying the previous one, they were they're adding to the accuracy and improving upon uh, what was already had. And so I guess you'd have to answer that question. Then you have to answer the question not only of the revisions to the received text, but the revisions to the King James Version itself. It was a, if it was a perfect, absolute, you know, preserved process. Uh, then why did the King James Version undergo multiple revisions for quite a while and the version that we have in read today is not even the original 1611 publication um, it underwent uh, I mean the the printing errors are well documented uh, causing the need for revision but also they did update the language uh, as the time change over the first little while and this is the very thing that the King James only adherents criticize for modern translation, saying this is God's word, it doesn't need to be updated. Well, that's exactly what happened uh, with the King James Version itself. So these are all, again, the King James only position is untenable and indefensive. And that's not a knock on the King James translation. As I said, it's it's been well vindicated in many respects uh, for its high degree of accuracy, especially considering the uh, resources that were available for the textual basis, um, or I should say the lack of resources that were available, have even under those limitations, it, it had an extremely high degree of accuracy and reliability, and we should applaud that, not criticize it, but we should also not be under the delusion that there is impossible to improve upon in any way, shape, or form. Um, that's just not the case either. So another comment that I received, um, it says uh, basically regarding your comment, quote unquote, much ado about nothing, some would disagree with you because the Bible says you should not add to or take away from God's word. So this was a comment I received about uh, some of the discussion from episode 25. So let me explain this a little bit. I said, you know, the bottom line is upon these variants and, and differences between different modern translations and more specifically the, the textual basis upon which uh, they are, are, are that, they come, that they come from. I said, you know, the, the final analysis, in my opinion, it's much ado about nothing. That's not to say that there's no differences. It's to say that some people get all worked up in, into a froth about the differences 
when in reality, no spiritual principles are compromised, uh, no moral precepts are jeopardized, no doctrinal tenets uh, are violated due to the variance between manuscripts or the, the differences between the textual basis itself. Um, so from that perspective, uh, people, you know, want to take sides. They want to defend their position. They want to, you know, criticize the, the other the other side, so to speak, when, when the bottom line is it, it really doesn't change anything important. Um, it really doesn't change our understanding of God's word in any significant way. And that's all I was saying about that. But the commenter is correct about God's word. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, they talking about not adding or taking away from God's word, but they don't, you know, they kind of paraphrase that. <laughs> but that notwithstanding, you know, Deuteronomy 4 and 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So the Deuteronomy 4 and 2, Deuteronomy 12 and 32 says, has very similar phrasing in that regard. Proverbs 35 and 6, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And of course, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19 uh, has some, uh, some uh, uh, very timely language about uh, adding on to the words of the prophecy and taking away from the words of the, the book. And so certainly we're not to do that. So the issue, though, when it comes to textual criticism and the textual basis between translations, you know, the, the received text, the majority text, the critical text, the issue is not whether modern translations have differences from the King James Version or the, or the critical text versus the received text. The real issue is, is if the former is guilty of diminishing from or taking away from God's word or is the latter guilty of adding to God's word? So on the topic of these, you know, missing words, phrases, uh, verses, the people in the critical text believe that the manuscript evidence points to uh, that, you know, perhaps uh, over the process of time in the transmission process, uh, perhaps there were some uh, added commentary that were not a part of the original manuscripts, and they have the manual, the manuscript evidence to substantiate this claim. Whereas those people who uh, are critical of the critical text are, are unsympathetic, we'll say, towards the critical text and the modern translations that, are, that stem from them, say, oh no, they have diminished from, they have taken away from God's word because there are verses that not hear. So every, everybody agrees, I think, in principle that um, with the word of God that we should not add to or take away from it. But the question is, who 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 is guilty of doing that? Now, um, what I would say on this is, in my opinion, if we take into account all of the manuscript evidence, it seems more reasonable to conclude that the received text possibly has some added commentary uh, than the critical. Uh, th that seems more plausible than that the critical text has deleted words or phrases or verses that should have been there. Again, I'm not going to go into the specifics or the details because I kind of covered that already, but this appears to be the most reasonable or logical conclusion, although we don't have and can't know with absolute certainty. Certainly other scenarios are possible, but I think when you really, you know, investigate the whole, the whole situation, that that's unlikely. It seems more, li more likely uh, that the critical text is, is closer to the autographs, in my opinion. I mean, from my informed opinion, I guess I should say. This doesn't mean that the received text was deliberately manipulated. It doesn't mean that it's compromised. Uh, we can take a more sympathetic view than that. For example, perhaps, you know, one suggestion is perhaps some explanatory notes or commentary that were originally intended uh, I should say originally not intended to be included in the actual text over the course of time inadvertently got put in there and then that was continued to be copied. Uh, since virtually none of the variants or differences result in any theological consequences, 
I don't know what the scribes or copyists would have had to gain by deliberately omit, omitting uh, these words and phrases uh, that are in view. Again, they don't, they're, they're not significant. So why take them out if they're not, you know, substantiating some theological viewpoint or something like that? So it seems like more probable that they would be added as explanatory phrases not include intended to be mistaken for the text itself than some scribe would decide to randomly omit words that are not offensive or contrary to what they believed or anything like that again that's just one that's one point um but you know the truth is out there i don't know that we can know it um but Here's my main point on that. It doesn't mean we have to side, take sides or choose one over the other. We should just be aware that there are differences between this, these textual bases, and we should be aware of the background and history that explain these differences. So when we read our Bible, uh, we know what these, I guess, for lack of a better term, disputed phrases and verses are. Um, and again, none of them are doctrinally significant in any way. Uh, even some of the most extreme cases where several verses are left out of the critical text and therefore the modern translations, um, they, the, 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 like at the end of that last 18 verses of the book of Mark, for example, those, those same truths are repeated elsewhere in scripture. So they're not removed. So the question is, um, you know, were they there in the original autographs? And if they weren't, maybe we should include them. But by the way, by the way, and this is very important to note. So I, I've been reading the CSB lately, the Christian Standard Bible. I've been enjoying it. And I know it's based on the critical text. So I was curious. I started looking up some of these uh, instances, including the, en the ending to the book of Mark. And it actually included it there. It just put a bracket around it with a little footnote that said the earliest manuscripts did not contain these verses or something to that effect. So it didn't like to remove it and take it out. And that's the case with most Bible translations and study Bibles. Now, some of the phrases that are, are even less significant or whatever, they may omit it and in place put a footnote and you have to read the footnote to see what the, what that phrase or word was, uh, but they're not hiding it from you. It's just their best, uh, most honest attempt to to honestly replicate what the original autographs uh, may have said. And again, it doesn't have any spiritual, theological, moral change or difference or, 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 or problem raised by it. And again, this doesn't mean, even if you take the view that I lean towards, that the critical text may be uh, more original, that seems the most likely reasonable uh, conclusion. That doesn't mean the received text was deliberately manipulated. We can take a more sympathetic view. Uh, it doesn't, we don't have to take sides. We don't have to choose. Um, we can enjoy both. We can uh, utilize both. We can understand that um, uh, the reasons for these differences and, and, uh, and in either case, we know what verses are, are in dispute. So move on to another comment here, uh, this other comment. Um, so I'm, I'm going to truncate this a little bit for the sake of time. But basically, this individual uh, tells a story about they, they work at a Christian business uh, and a business owned and operated by Christians. And as a part of their daily routine at this business, which I think is awesome, uh, they read Bible verses in the morning before they start the work day. And he says that they just have been reading from the ESV as they do this group devotional together to start their day in the workplace. Um, and so, um, and then he goes on to say in this part, I'll, I'll read verbatim, uh, some of the differences. So he also says before I, uh, he also says that he reads, um, while they're reading from the ESV, the Bible he's holding is the King James Version. And so he's kind of comparing and contrasting the verses. So th this part I'll read verbatim. He says, some of the differences may seem small on the surface, but sometimes it's enough to change the meaning, sometimes slightly and sometimes not so slightly. Something that makes me very uncomfortable. And so, I mean, that's a very interesting comment and a very astute comment. And, you know, I've also heard other, 
I guess semi-related comments. Uh, I'm not saying that this that this individual was driving at the same thought or whatever, but I've heard other related comments uh, that you know, for example, the NIV. Just to to take to use an example, the NIV, the translators deliberately mistranslated certain phrases uh, because they wanted to change the meaning or substantiate a certain view, or the accusation that you know. You fill in the blank. X modern translation has a very liberal bias, and uh, the the translators were liberal, and they have an agenda that they're trying to advance. Okay, these things are just not true, as far as I can tell. Uh, not true as a whole. Now, some I'm not saying that every Bible translator on every committee is super conservative in their personal religious viewpoints. But as a whole, and you can go in and read about the translation committee and their credentials and those sort of things for any, you know, do a little research. Almost every modern Bible translation has a web page that they freely discuss all the processes and, and philosophy and methodology of their Bible translation. They'll tell you who's on the committee. Most of these have a committee of somewhere between a dozen and say 20 or so. Uh, members that are the primary contributors, but they also utilize, um, you know, suggestions and and, and translation uh, uh, bits from hundreds of different contributors. Um, so you know that's a good thing because that would kind of negate any bias that may exist. But also, I mean, I, I follow the um, the video uh, blog, I guess you could call it, of Bill Mounts, who was a is a Bible translator. I think he was like the chair of the NIV translation committee and also uh, an active member of the ESV uh, translated translation committee. And he talks about in his experience that um, people don't uh, the very the other translators they don't contend for a translation that the supports their own particular religious view or whatever. He said just the opposite is the case. Uh, they always try to check and 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 uh, uh, put checks and balances in place to ensure that any bias that they may have is not reflected in their translation that's why so many different eyeballs look at it and a, and a, an agreement between many scholars of many different i guess backgrounds and persuasions ha have to look at it and on some of the translations the csb for example uh, it says right in the right in their kind of expl explanatory introduction uh, that they are all conservative evangelical scholars, for example, who all who who agree with the uh, doctrine of the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. So they, you know these are not theologically uh, liberal people trying to manipulate and persuade us not to be uh, at least, uh, and I think that's true in all cases. At any rate, um, you know, it's interesting that people would make, and I'm not saying that this commenter was making that kind of thing, but I think that's kind of the, the thinking that kind of is influencing these thoughts, like these changes, um, uh, you know, these slight changes, they're, they're concerning. I don't, I don't know why they're concerning exactly, but um, so these accusations of, of mis deliberate mistranslations, liberal biases, agenda or manipulation, um, you know, again, I'm not a fan of King James only uh, viewpoint that, that there's no other translation that has any worth or value. Um, and I think these types of, of misinformation kind of results from from that. It's just simply not true. There's there's no that can't be substantiated. It's just rumor and innuendo that has no basis in reality. Um, and you know, I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm not saying I believe that believe this, but if anything, if there's any if there's any document text uh, that might be theologically biased. I would think it would be the Byzantine text on which the received text is is uh, compiled uh, because it was all the same Greek Orthodox uh, viewpoint that were that were transmitting this. And if if there's any uh, you know English translation that might have uh, uh, some sort of religious bias to it. Um, I would think it would be the King James version because this is the authorized version 
of the Church of England. And, uh, and it's no, it's no uh, secret, even the introduction to the original 1611 version of the King James Version talks about how that this version came about because it was specifically commanded by King James, the king, to conform to the ecclesiology of the Church of England. And one of the primary motivators for creating this new English language text was to dissuade Puritan perf uh, defections, to to put it, to try to put an end to uh, people defecting to the Puritan Church and leaving the Church of England. And so there was specific areas, specific verses and stories that they translated in such a way to minimize these defections. Uh, and not just the text itself, but also some of the explanatory notes from the Geneva Bible and others. And so there was an obvious bias and agenda there that the, uh, that the, now again, I don't think that that makes it a bad translation. I don't think that that makes it corrupt in any way. I'm just saying it's ironic <laughs> that there is, uh, you know, at least a shred of truth or, or a historical context behind the King James Version but but we want to criticize modern translation where they make every effort, at least it appears they make every effort to minimize uh, any kind of bias or agenda that may go into these translations. And so I, I just want to point out the irony, not that I, you know, not that I think there's anything wrong, inherently wrong with the Byzantine text or the King James Version. I'm just kind of comparing and contrasting here. So this comment about the English Standard Version is his apprehension because of the sometimes slight and sometimes not so slight changes make him uncomfortable. It seems um, that he's very sincere and, and you know, uh, sincerely concerned, uh, but also, and I don't mean this in a derogatory or insulting way, uh, but this commenter himself has an obvious bias. It seems like he's just automatically assuming if there is any differentiation or distinction uh, or slight or not so slight uh, change in, in, in the supposed meaning or interpretation of the text, that it is the, the ESV that is either deliberately misleading or in error or, uh, or whatever the case may be. I don't want to put words in this person's mouth. Uh, but why couldn't it be the case uh, that uh, the, the ESV or, or another modern uh, English translation uh, could be perhaps slightly more accurate or more insightful on a particular word when there's a distinction or difference? Uh, at least in some cases, does it have to be in every case that the King James is superior or that it's, it's more insightful or more accurate or, or whatever? Um, you know, language difference, that's one point I'll make. But another point, just because you discern a, a slight differentiation uh, between, you know, the way two modern or two English translations are phrased, these language differences are not tantamount to conflict and disagreement in every case. Uh, sometimes, you know, the English Standard Version may be more literal, uh, more literal, more true to the actual uh uh, uh, Greek text, it's, text itself, in some cases, another translation uh, may better convey the meaning but be less literal. In, in, in either case, we shouldn't and automatically assume and have the bias that whenever there's a difference, the King James Version is supreme in that regard. Um, again, I'm not knocking or bashing the King James Version. I'm just trying to get us to understand that these other modern contemporary versions bring something to the table. They have something to offer. And we, we shouldn't, we, there's no need to take sides. There's no need to uh, be exclusively wed to one and reject another. Um, we can have our cake and eat it too in this sense. And finally, I guess the final um, point I'll address, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read a specific comment, but several people, not only in reaction to uh, episode 25, uh, but throughout my ministry, um, um, several people, I teach Bible classes, I've taught Bible studies, um, 
obviously a preacher of the word and that sort of thing. But over the years, and also more specifically recently in reaction to this discussion, people have asked me my opinion regarding which translation is, sometimes they say, what do you think is the best translation? Or what, it, what is the most accurate translation? Or what's the most literal translation? Well, you know, those are all judgment value. I can, I can tell you which ones I enjoy, which ones I prefer, which ones I think have specific um, you know, characteristics that I deem um, uh, interesting or useful. But in terms of the best or more accurate or most literal, I, I don't think that's, that's a question we can answer. And I don't. Um, now, it's true that some, you know, take a, a position in a, in a translation philosophy to be more literal. And we'll get into that to a moment. But I want to make several points here before I kind of answer that question. Number one, there's no such thing as a word for word translation. In other words, here's this this word in the Greek means this word in the English. Now that can be the case sometimes, but that's not always the case and that's not even more most generally the case. Some some vocabulary terms in the Greek uh, don't have an exact English equivalent. Sometimes they'll have an approximation. Sometimes there's not a very good approximation. Other times it might have a, a literal, uh, fairly clear equivalent, but um, a, and a word can have uh, multiple meanings, both in the Greek and in the, and in the English. And some of the meanings in one language don't necessarily collate to the meanings in the other language. But even when they do, uh, we don't know which meaning always is intended. We can infer the intended meaning. We can interpret it, the intended usage based on the context of the verse and the passage. Uh, but that's uh, uh, an interpretation that we have to make. It's not just a clear rule of looking up a word in the dictionary. So Bill Mounds, who I already mentioned, is famous Bible translator, Greek, Greek uh, um, expert. He, he gives a, in a pod, a, a video uh, blog I was listening to, he gave an exp, uh, example rather of, the, uh, of an English word, the word key. K-E-Y, key. Okay, so just if, and I went, I went ahead and looked up the word key in just the online dictionary here. And just the noun form alone has 33 entries, <laughs> 33 definitions for the word key. If we if we if we include also the verbs and adjective form of the word key, that's 48. So almost 50. Uh, def now, some of them are similar, but I mean, some of them are widely different. So if we hear that word key, what is meant by the speaker or writer, uh, we have to assume or infer or conclude from the context. But and if the, and it's not always not exact science. We have to have more information often. So just for example, obviously a key is a small metal instrument uh, to, to uh, open a lock. I'm paraphrasing some of these. Um, something that affords a mean of access. So it doesn't, it, it's a metaphor in that regard. It doesn't have to be a literal key, but something that affords a mean of access. Um, and we get into a book, pamphlet, or other text containing solutions or translations given somewhere else, like the key to a map, for example. A systematic explanation of abbreviations or symbols, again, like a map. We move forward down a little bit. In music, a key is something totally different. It's the same word, spelled the same, pronounced the same, totally different meaning when we're talking about instrumentation and, and uh, music notation. Uh, or even the tone or pitch of a voice. That's even different. Even within the music explanation, it has a slightly different meanings and, and, uh, and what have you. In computers, it means other things. In electricity, it means other things. In biology, it means other things. In architecture, it means other things. In sports, it means other things, like top of the key in basketball, for example. In photography, it means other things. So this one word key has literally dozens of, of, of definitions and explanations. And so, I mean, just to say that this Greek word equals this English word, even when that's the case, which it often is, that doesn't tell the whole story. We still have some, some, you know, more to do. So that's just one, I guess, not problem, but challenge in interpreting scripture and translating from one language to another. 
Um, you know, also on top of that, and I'm just going to stick with the Greek here because that's what I know most about. Some grammatical structures that exist in the Greek language simply do not exist in the English language. And uh, so in those cases, interpretation or approximation is necessary. And I'll just give two quick explanations that I remember from my college Greek courses. Uh, one is in Greek nouns. Uh, there's different cases for nouns in, in every language. So in Greek and other languages have a genitive case. Well, the genitive case does not exist in the English language. So we have to approximate the meaning uh, because we don't have that same grammatical structure. In English, a gen genitive case uh, it typically is is translated as a possessive or prepositional fr phrase, but it's its own case in the Greek language. Uh, Greek verbs, and again, this is just two examples. I'm sure there's others, but these are some of the most uh, noteworthy, I guess. Uh, in the Greek language, there's different, you know, in English language, we have, you know, uh, past tense, present tense, future tense, and there's other tenses as well. But in the Greek language, there's this aorist tense. Uh, they kind of describe it as a, as in the Greek as a perfective past. There is no equivalent in the English language. There's no aorist tense. So typically, translators see an aorist tense. They typically translate simple past tense in English. So there's a distinction there. Does it make a huge difference in our uh, in understanding what the Greek says? Typically not, maybe not, maybe not, but the point is there's challenges to translations. It's, it's impossible to say that in all cases, this is the best translation. This is the only acceptable translation. I mean, uh, these are things that, that have to be figured out and interpretation is necessary. And that's why there's often revisions and corrections and improvements in, in biblical texts. And that's not even to mention metaphors. Uh, which uh, a metaphor is a figure of speech uh, in which a word or phrase is applied to an object and not intended to be literally applicable. Um, those kind of have some cultural value to them that may be missed on modern modern readers if it weren't for interpreting and, uh, and explaining it dynamically. Idioms are even harder to translate. Of course, an idiom is an expression or phrase that has an established meaning that is not deducible from the actual meaning of the individual words. And you may remember from your English classes, an, an example of an English uh, idiom is it's raining cats and dogs. Well, um, to you and I who are American English speakers, we know that means it's raining really hard outside. But if you're not a native English speaker and not from the American culture, you might have no idea what that means. Um, it it so, seems almost ridiculous to think someone couldn't d easily deduce the meaning, but it's because it's a part of our language and we know the cultural expression, what it means. If you don't know the cultural expression, what it means, then, it, then you're, you're tempted to, to try to translate it literally. Perhaps a better example is we sung, that's, um, uh, that's when I saw the light not just in a religious sense, but anything, I saw the light. Well, literally that means, oh, you're looking around for a light. Oh, there's no, there's no light. Well, that means that's when I understood what was being said, or that's when I came to the conclusion or got the revelation or whatever. But if you're not familiar with that English or American idiom, uh, then you, you would tempt to take it literally. And to, to us, these are easy to understand, but that's not always the case. There's idioms that exist in other languages that we wouldn't understand if we heard a native speaker speak them. So, you know, often in these and other scenarios, we are left to interpret the meaning. And this is, this is why, to me, and this, this highlights and emphasizes kind of a bigger point that I'm trying to make. This is why many English translations with different approaches and methodologies and translation philosophies is actually a good thing. It's actually a beneficial thing because when, you know, a meaning of a verse is a little bit unclear or we'd like to have more information and background so we can understand it better, uh, we have uh, a, a plethora of resources to consult, translations uh, that bring out the meaning in slightly different ways to add to our understanding. And so 
and that will, I, I guess the, uh, well, I was going to I was going to say one more thing to talk about kind of verbal equivalencies and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm going to save that for another time because I've already spoken a lot in this podcast. So perhaps I'll share that again soon, some more information. So I appreciate all the comments I received. I'm not trying to be derogatory or insensitive or insulting to any of these comments but I just wanted to respond to them and react to them. So, A, you can see where I'm coming from and kind of clarify the points I'm trying to make and the arguments I'm trying to make. So God bless you, whether you read the King James Version or whether you read the English Standard Version, the NIV, the CSB, Christian Standard Bible, which I've been enjoying here lately. Uh, I think all of them have such a high degree of accuracy. They should all be considered God's Word. Uh, regardless of the, the minor variants and differences that they might have between them. And uh, I think personally we're fortunate to live at a time where there is so much scholarship, where there's so much time and energy being put into understanding God's Word. And there's so many wonderful resources that we could take advantage of uh, to grow and develop and understand God's Word, uh, perhaps like never before. Uh, available uh, in human history. So God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, as always, I appreciate every single person who takes the time to listen with, to Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. So until next time, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you again for listening. Farewell for now.